Hello, uh, my name is Jeff Sparks. I'm an assistant professor of medicine and a rheumatologist at Brigham Women's Hospital and Harvard Medical School. Um, it's my distinct pleasure to talk with you about RAILD. This is a topic near and dear to my heart, and I really thank Dr. Cush and Dr. Cavanaugh and all the other organizers of Room Now Live for inviting me, and I wish I was there in person, hopefully next year. Um, here are my disclosures. I have performed some consultancy for these companies listed. And also mention I am active on Twitter at Jeff Sparks if you wanted to chat about uh, RAILD or other topics. Um, so here's the broad outline that I hope we'll accomplish today. Um, I'm going to touch on the epidemiology, and I really want to make sure that you guys really understand the subtypes of RAILD. I think that can be imposing. Um, I'll talk about your outcomes about why this is important, um, and then risk factors which are really emerging, and then you know really high high yield clinical pearls related to diagnosis and management. So we'll first start briefly about RAILD epidemiology, and here's a graphic about the uh, uh, airways and the lungs, which I think was nice. Um, so I think one question that comes up often is how often does RAILD actually occur within RA? And actually the question is not really very well answered. And this varies widely, mostly based on case finding methods and the denominator being studied. So for instance, if you just scan all of your patients, you might find some abnormalities in up to 40% of patients. Uh, and you probably have experienced this already in patients that have had chest imaging for other reasons, that it's pretty common for there to be um, abnormal chest imaging. And then you start scratching your head and saying, does this patient have RILD? Are they at risk for developing it in the future? And that's certainly an active research area and something that I'm pretty interested in. Certainly we do know that some of those patients progress, but certainly uh, we don't expect 40% of patients to develop clinically significant RILD. Um, so clinically significant RILD, you know, loosely meaning that the patients are above a threshold of clinical uh, severity that they either, they either present through um, symptoms or they're detected through routine clinical care. Um, this also has a pretty wide variation, but it's typically down in the two to 8% of RA patients. Um, and that certainly can vary based on demographics and geography. Um, probably the, the, the most definitive study was a study in Mayo Clinic that estimated a lifetime incidence of RAILD to occur up to 7.7% of patients in RAILD. Uh, there was another large study looking at um, death records that had ILD listed as a potential cause of death in 6.6%. So probably on the upper limit of clinically significant is gonna be around 8% of patients, which, you know, there's a lot of RA patients and you think about your own practice, thinking about 8% of them have or will develop ILD as, as a fair number of patients. So it is a public health problem. Um, there's another autopsy study that, you know, really just looked at all patients who had died of RA for any cause and found that 35% of those patients had some evidence of RAILD and 9% of them died of respiratory failure related to RAILD. So again, I think this is a public health problem. And actually, interestingly, compared to all the other things about RA, which have all seemed to be improving over calendar time and in the biologic era, RALD is, seems to be one of the few characteristics of RA that is worsening over calendar time. So prevalence seems to be increasing. And you know, there's certainly active research into that question as well. Um, are, are the novel medications actually making patients more likely to develop it? Are patients living longer? Um, is this because of more advanced imaging so that we're finding more cases that necessarily would not have been caught before? I think probably a combination of all those factors, but certainly if, if you see enough RA patients, you're gonna see some RAILD and hopefully this um, talk will help, help you in your practice. Um, so now I wanted to move on to RAILD subtypes. And again, I think this is a really imposing thing about RAILD nomenclature and, and ILD in particular. Um, so hopefully you'll come away with some uh, uh, bullet points about how to categorize your patients and how the subphenotyping can help. So one thing to think about is, you know, ILD occurs certainly in patients without RA, 
Uh, and sometimes your patient with RA, they also have ILD due to another cause. So it is, inter it is good to think about the other causes of ILD and how that might pertain to your patient. Um, broadly speaking, identifiable etiology, you know, if they have a rheumatic disease, obviously RA being one of them, but certainly some of our RA patients have overlap with other um, autoimmune diseases and rheumatic diseases. Um, certainly occupational and environmental exposure, drug-induced toxicity, radiation-induced toxicity, all of this happens within RA patients. Um, and then there's a sarcoidosis as its own sort of category. And again, certainly you do have patients with RA and sarcoidosis. And then third would be the other category, which would be LAM, uh, pulmonary Langerhans cell histiocytosis, pulmonary alveolar proteinosis, um, and then the really category that most people think about for ILD is the idiopathic interstitial pneumonias or IIPs. And those are broadly categorized based on idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis or IPF, and then the non-IPF IIPs, which are listed here as sort of an alphabet soup. And I'll kind of go over this in, a, in another slide in more detail. So really RAILD really kind of lives analogous to this sort of category of uh, idiopathic interstitial pneumonias, except they have an underlying disease. But really within RAILD, this framework um, really has sort of a same um, uh, dichotomy where the, uh, the uh, IPF version within RA is sort of usual interstitial pneumonia, which is typically more fibrotic. And then you have a grab bag of the different non-IPF um, ILDs. So here's sort of one of the, the main take home slides about RAILD and subtypes. First off, at least half of RAILD is typically usual interstitial pneumonia or UIP. And that's actually pretty easy to remember. It's usual, so it's more common and it's the most common subtype of RAILD occurring 50, 60% of patients that have RAILD. And it's typically a fibrotic pathogenesis. Uh, the second most common subtype is NSIP or nonspecific interstitial pneumonia. And that comprises 30 to 40% of, of RAILD. And it has subtypes, confusingly, called cellular NSIP and fibrotic NSIP. And right off the bat, you can see that there probably is some overlap between these. There's a little bit of blurring of edges, and you know, not every, necessarily everyone fits neatly into these categories. Um, and so certainly there could be patients that have a fibrotic NSIP or UIP or both in, 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 in combination. And this is why having a multidisciplinary approach to diagnosis is helpful because having a pulmonologist who really is used to thinking about the classification, having radiologists, the chest radiologist with expertise, pathologists who, um, to try to put everything together to draw the, try to really categorize your patient correctly. Um, so the other um, subcategories would be desquamative interstitial pneumonia or DIP, which is typically smoking related, respiratory bronchiolitis or RB, which is also typically smoking related, and then diffuse to alveolar damage. These are patients that typically present pretty dramatically often with pulmonary hemorrhage and you know, may be critically ill. Um, luckily, this doesn't occur that often in RA, but can happen. Uh, organizing pneumonia, which has sort of more like infiltrates compared to the other ILDs, um, and then lymph lymphoid interstitial pneumonia. And it's also important to remember that your patient might have other etiologies on top of this. So smoking, inhalants, certainly gastroesophageal reflux disease that you know, can have some you know, acid actually have a chemical pneumonitis, infection from our drugs and other things. Certainly our patients can get malignancy and the overlap syndromes. And so we're doing a lot less lung biopsies now, but it is sometimes needed for ambiguous CT chest imaging that um, you know, just you got to know that the, the CT chest is not necessarily going to be the end all be all. So again, I really want to, you know, take away about UIP and NSIP of being the two most pre prevalent um, subtypes of RILD. Uh, and here's an example of UIP. I gave you one that's very obvious that probably everyone would have already known, but, you know, the buzzwords on a, on a report would be scarring, reticulation, mosaicism, traction, bronchiectasis, and honeycombing. And again, this is a fibrotic process, so there's less inflammation. There's going to be less likely to have, you know, ground glass and other inflammatory features on chest imaging. NSIP, on the other hand, is a bit more inflammatory. So you're going to find ground glass opacities. Um, it also seems to have a predominance of lower lobe volume loss and reticulonodular opacities. Um, and again, there's certainly overlap on chest imaging.
Um, this is a bit of a tangent, but actually I think this is coming up a bit more often, um, this entity called COPA syndrome. Um, this is in the COPA gene, which stands for the copy coat complex subunit alpha. I, I mention this because these patients have a very um, uh, chronic and sometimes dramatic course that's uh, characterized by inflammatory arthritis, fever, interstitial lung disease, and kidney dysfunction. And they often have autoantibodies, including rheumatoid factor and CCP. So these often do end up in a rheumatologist's office. Um, family history is common. You know, it's, the textbooks say that it typically presents in adolescence, but I have seen adults that have presented with it. And often these patients are sick and they don't really respond like you would think. And um, so just think about this entity as sort of an underlying genetic syndrome, um, you know, maybe on the spectrum of rheumatoid arthritis, but really has its own separate pathogenesis and is really difficult to treat. Okay, so now I wanted to talk about RAILD outcomes, and this is why this is one of the most feared extraarticular manifestations of rheumatoid arthritis. Um, so the first thing to just remember is that RA is a chronic disease, is associated with excess mortality, um, and this seems to be more pronounced in seropositive RA. You can see the numbers from a study that we did a few years ago that overall patients with RA have a 40% increased risk for death compared to, patient, to the general population, and that this is really much more dramatic for the seropositive version of RA with rheumatoid factor or CCP with a 51% increased risk. Um, and I think this is where there's been a lot of progress in, in the respiratory components of, of rheumatoid arthritis is that, you know, 10, 15 years ago, everyone was thinking only about cardiovascular disease. But actually, when you look at a relative risk, respiratory mortality is really the thing that's much more dramatically different than the general population compared to cardiovascular mortality. And certainly cardiovascular disease mortality is a big deal. It's a big public health issue. And from an absolute scale, this is still the number one killer for rheumatoid arthritis patients. But from a, re from a relative risk perspective, there's a twofold increased risk for, for respiratory mortality of RA patients compared to the general population. And interestingly, this seems to be specifically for seropositive patients who have nearly a threefold increased risk for respiratory mortality compared to the general population. And certainly, RALD is a major contributor to that. And as another topic, there's been other um, airways disease and other uh, respiratory uh, issues with RA that can also contribute to that beyond just ILD. Um, but, you know, probably most of you might be familiar with this seminal paper from 2007 from the Mayo Clinic and Bungarts and all um, that really carefully found all the incident RA ILD within the Mayo Clinic population. And they actually found that the median survival was less than three years after RA ILD diagnosis. So, you know, really increased mortality. Some other studies have followed up that, um, and, you know, luckily for our patients, the survival seems to be improving, or maybe we're detecting less severe cases, but um, probably more recent studies show a, a median survival about eight years after RA-ILD detection. Um, but certainly it's a really, you know, increased risk compared to other RA patients. Um, we just did a, a, a a recent study looking at mortality after RAILD in the Medicare population, and we found that uh, the risk for mortality was increased by about 70%. Other studies have found it even higher, but certainly these patients are at a high risk for poor outcomes. And this is not explained by smoking. Uh, our studies in particular, we've accounted for smoking. And you would expect this to really um, affect respiratory mortality, which we see there as a fourfold increased risk. But Interestingly, our recent study showed that RALD patients are also at risk for cancer mortality, suggesting that some of these um, ILD lesions might predispose to cancer or might be sort of early cancerous changes themselves. Um, so these patients are at risk of poor outcomes. But, you know, RALD, as I've already mentioned, is not just one entity. And I think that's why this has been hard to study is that the natural our history of RALD really varies quite significantly based on the, the person, based on their subtype and how aggressive it is and what their threshold is for clinical significance. You, so, um, you know, there's some patients that really present acutely and have a really precipitous decline. This would be this person in red. Some patients are, you know, severely ill, but might present a bit slower, but more monotonically. But then there's patients that have 
episodes of severity and flare and remission and severity. So, you know, this is nothing new from a rheumatologist perspective that there's a lot of heterogeneity of the, of the, based on the person themselves, as well as probably the, you know, heterogeneous subtypes that are there. And then there's these people that are kind of under the surface and some people might have some mild, mild imaging changes that never causes symptoms. And maybe it just completely goes away. Maybe it was due to an occupational exposure or some other environmental. Maybe someone has subclinical changes that seem to be getting slowly worse over time. And you're watching this person and you're wondering, are they ever going to go over this sort of barrier for clinical significance? Um, so certainly this is part of the reason why there needs to be a lot of vigilance, but also take a deep breath and, you know, you know, time is sometimes on your side. Uh, and obviously research is needed to try to understand where patients fit in these curves. Um, one other thing to keep in mind based on subtype is that the UIP subtype does seem to have a worse prognosis compared to the others for the most part. Um, so the UIP is more likely to progress related to pulmonary function tests. There's a threefold higher increased risk for DLCO progression compared to NSIP. Um, and then mortality, which obviously everyone cares about, seems to be increased in this subtype. Um, it was a systematic review, had an increased risk of death for 66% compared to all the other subtypes. Um, however, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, diffuse alveolar damage can present very um, abruptly and can, is uncommon, but can be highly lethal. Okay, so now let's go into RALD risk factors. Um, and I'll mention this is a you know, active research area of our group. And this is sort of a schematic about how the lungs are involved in RA pathogenesis and also about why this might predispose patients to um, interstitial lung disease. And so obviously some genetics will predispose patients to both RA and ILD. Um, and there's inflammation, disruption in the lungs themselves, maybe at other mucosal surfaces. And perhaps there's a neoantigen presentation of citrullination of proteins. And this is, you know, the peptidyl arginine deaminase enzyme um, forms these neoantigens and the body becomes confused and presents these to T cells through the HLA-DRB1 shared epitope, uh, and this activates the immune system to start making antibodies, which then eventually settle into joints and patients present with symptoms. And at some point, they might present with um, pulmonary inflammation as well. Um, and certainly some patients might actually have lung inflammation that precedes the articular um, involvement as well. Uh, so I just wanna pause here about a case. Um, this is a 70 year old man with rheumatoid factor positive, CCP positive RA for 15 years, currently in remission by DAS28, doing well on hydroxychloroquine, methotrexate, and tilsiluzumab. Uh, he does have 45 years, pack years of smoking, known COPD, and his CRP is normal. So, first, I just want you to look to see what are his RA ILD risk factors, to sort of reflect on what the stem's there and can you find any risk factors? And I'm betting you're going to find a few. Okay, so in the red, I've highlighted the risk factors. So 70 year old man, so older age, male sex, rheumatoid factor positive, CCP positive. So both of these antibodies, particularly a high titer, seem to predispose patients to RILD. Uh, longstanding RA, typically over 10 years, can predispose people to RILD. Um, however, being in remission and having a normal CRP seems to be protective. Um, and then 45 pack years of smoking. So probably not a surprise that smoking is related to RAILD, but I'll tell you a bit more about pack years later. Uh, and COPD is also a risk factor. And certainly there might be some patients that might on paper seem to have COPD and had RAILD all along. Um, I will say that I did not highlight any of the medications because really the jury's out for a lot of this, but I think we for sure, and I'll go into this later, that methotrexate does not increase the risk of incident RALD. But overall, it's pretty unclear about how medications can alter the natural history. The other thing I'll note is that I didn't say anything about symptoms. So even though this patient has a lot of risk factors for RALD, it's currently insufficient data to screen for ILD in patients that are asymptomatic. However, this patient would qualify for low dose chest CT screening based on his uh, pack year history. So it certainly would be reasonable to get a low dose chest CT to screen for lung cancer 
And as a side effect, you could also screen for IAL, RAILD. Um, so here's a, a, a list of sort of things that you would find perhaps in the clinic uh, that are related to RAILD. The first would be male sex. And this is kind of interesting given that, you know, most RA patients are women. So there's a bit of a, a sex paradox in that uh, women are more likely to get RA, but men are more likely to get ILD within RA. Uh, genetics, the MUC5B promoter variant, and I have a slide on that later. And then lifestyle. Um, we recently did a, a, a report that showed that the threshold of 30 pack years seems to be most important for RAILD with an odds ratio of over six compared to never smoking. Uh, we also found that obesity was a risk factor for RAILD, lung comorbidities such as asthma and COPD. And there's a lot of RA characteristics now, older age at RA diagnosis, typically older than 60, uh, longer RA duration, typically 10 or more years, and then having high articular disease activity, a paper that we published recently showing that moderate or high RA disease activity had a hazard ratio of over two compared to remission or low. And along those lines, higher CRP, worse MHAC scores, and high rheumatoid factor and ACPA titers. So there's actually a lot of data that you're collecting routinely that you can already apply to your patients to sort of risk stratify them related to their risk of RA ILD. Uh, I did want to take a, a moment to talk about this MUC5B, which is a really exciting development in the RA ILD field. Um, so this is a promoter variant of mucin 5B, which is basically one of the proteins that's expressed in the airways and alveoli. It kind of acts as sort of a surfactant. Uh, and basically this promoter variant tells your body to produce a bit more of this MUC5B in greater quantities and probably over exuberant amount, particularly related to infections or inhalants is sort of the thought process. Um, regardless of the etiology, this is cert certainly, you know, strongly associated with RAILD, odds ratio of over um, almost five compared to the general population and then three compared to patients within RA. This is also the same gene uh, genetic factor for IPF. So this is very specifically associated with the UIP subtype. So more work needs to be done related to the NSIP subtype. Um, and this, this paper also showed that honeycombed lung tissue with RAILD overexpressed MUC5B. Um, so this is kind of, if you know the shared epitope story, this is kind of like analogous to the shared epitope of RAILD. And um, certainly this is not something we check clinically yet, but uh, there's a lot of research being done about MUC5B and it's gonna be interesting to see whether this could be applied clinically and how it might help us understand uh, treatment paradigms. Okay, so now we'll, we'll veer off into some more clinical topics um, about diagnosis. Um, so here's the same patient and I've only added that he's now tells you and maybe after you you know, really doing a thorough review of systems that he has a dry cough and a shorter breath after walking short distances. And the question is, what workup should you pursue? And obviously, I think this is a difficult history. And, you know, one of the um, things about RA is that people who have high disease activity and aren't walking are not going to complain of, of any lung issues. So in your patients with high disease activity, and obviously you're doing a lot of attention to their joints, um, really thinking about their lungs and, you know, what's limiting them as far as ambulation. Is it their joints or is it their deconditioning or is it their lungs to try to think about this? Because certainly there's probably a long period of time where this is sort of smoldering under the surface. Um, and it is a judgment call as far as, you know, when are they really symptomatic versus sort of when are they not? But um, for these purposes, we're going to say that you're suspicious that there could be going something going on. So what workup should you pursue? Well, Obviously, it, it probably um, behooves everyone to not get tunnel vision and just because they have RA and just because they have a lot of risk factors for ILD doesn't mean they don't have anything else. Um, and I don't think I need to read everything on here, but, you know, really doing a thorough history and physical, thinking about what other things could be related to their dyspnea and cough, thinking about chronicity, severity, obviously infection, um, certainly some other RA related lung diseases that are possible. Um, you know, GERD, again, this is a pretty common issue for patients to have GERD contributing to sort of uh, lung issues. Um, so obviously be a great uh, internal medicine doctor and think about all of the other options before you really go down the rabbit hole that is RAILD. Um, so yeah, having said that, here's my diagnostic approach. Obviously, I just told you to, have to do a thorough history and physical, 
Obviously things that would tip me off to RAILD would be dyspnea, dry cough, chest pain, fatigue, you know, obviously if they have some low oxygen saturations or high respiratory rate, we'll think about that. And I really do try to do a thorough lung exam, really thinking, looking for rales and crackles and also looking at clubbing when you're looking for nail pits, um, which do turn up from time to time. So in patients that I'm suspicious of, um, certainly doing an in-office in chest X-ray is pretty straightforward. Um, PFTs, ideally with lung volumes and DLCO, sometimes spirometry enough at the very beginning is okay. Um, and certainly if they have some, you know, borderline oxygen saturations, taking them on a six-minute walk test um, is really of high use to see whether they're desat or not, which obviously would really make you think about lung etiologies. Um, and I do have, uh, you know, relatively low threshold for a high-res chest CT. Obviously, I'll say I'm a bit biased because I think so much about this, and we do do it for research purposes. But um, there's so much that can be gained from a high-res chest CT, and really everything else is going to be inadequate to really diagnose this. But obviously, consider a cardiac and GI workup. And the other thing, we're doing a lot less lung biopsies nowadays, but um, it, they are really helpful for diagnostic uncertainty, clinical deterioration, and certainly you can, you know, catch a cancer, you know, you're not going to necessarily catch a cancer on chest CT. Um, you know, thinking about bronchoscopy, BAL, things like that. So having a multidisciplinary approach to try to think about what sort of measures they might do involving pulmonary radiology, pathology. And again, I'll reiterate that there's no current evidence to screen people for RALT who are asymptomatic. Um, so here's some chest x-ray findings that, you know, might be good enough to, to sort of make you you know, think they really have RALD compared to one of the alternate etiologies, but here's some bilateral reticular opacities, some reduced lung volumes. Um, so, um, you know, this can be very helpful. All right, so back to our patient. So what did we do? We did a chest X-ray, we did labs, we did PFTs and a six minute walk test. I would say that this patient with a you know, short of breath walking short distances, you could definitely think about um, coronary ischemia um, and certainly would be reasonable to go down that pathway and uh, in concert with uh, thinking about RAILD. All right, so management strategy, probably the thing that people really care the most about. And some, of, some unfortunately, we know relatively little about this. And obviously, we'll try to help out with uh, uh, getting some trials that will give us some high quality evidence. But I'll try to go through what sort of my rationale and what my approach is. Um, you know, first is, you know, whether and when to initiate pharmacological therapy. Um, again, this is a multidisciplinary approach at our, at our group, thinking about disease severity, how confident we are with the diagnosis, evidence for progression, risk factors for progression, comorbidities, and obviously the patient preference. Um, as far as you know, how often I monitor people, I'd say at least every six months, um, you know, depending on the rapidity of their clinical course, it might be more often or maybe even less often, but, you know, getting things about symptom measurements and health related quality of life and PFTs, you know, there's really not a lot of downside to that. Um, so, you know, PFTs are definitely something I like to repeat pretty often. Um, and then the HRCT, I think it is very helpful to repeat those and as well as the chest X-ray, uh, often a little bit less often than the other testing just because of the radiation issues. Uh, but certainly, as you know, this does give you some granularity about whether they're kind of stable or at least uh, maybe heading in the wrong direction. Um, and then about uh, changing or escalating treatment, you know, really some of the same issues about are they really progressing? Um, you know, this is the art of medicine like anything else, you know, is the... Is, is the treatment helping more than it's hurting and, and all those sorts of things about whether to change or escalate treatment. All right, so here's a 55 year old woman with RA for two years and she's strongly seropositive on methotrexate and adalimumab. She has a worsening dry cough and dyspnea on exertion. CT chest shows reticular pattern with early signs of honeycombing and is a non-smoker. What medication changes or additions would you offer? Um, so we're going to go back to that patient. And in fact, I'll just highlight that it does seem very suspicious for RALD. And I'll say that you're going to be doing your due diligence, but you know, certainly women can still get RALD. Um, patients in early RA can still get RALD. In fact, there was a recent abstract saying that 50% of RALD does occur during early RA. Um, and she's a non-smoker. So, you know, she's got some things that should put her at low risk for RALD, but 
certainly these patients, as you know, still do can develop this. Um, so here's sort of the overall framework about how I think about RAL demedication options. And I think this has been a paradigm shift as well. I'd be interested to hear what others think as well. You, you know, the, the antifibrotics of nintendinab and profenadone are not yet really approved for RAILD. They're really approved for IPF and a few other conditions that I'll go over later. However, the pathogenesis is very similar to RALD. One of the big trials in these medications did include patients with RALD, and certainly there's, there's trials ongoing. And so I think that a lot of RALD specialists have been using antifibrotics, uh, particularly for the UIP pattern or other fibrotic patterns that might be coming up. As far as other sort of lung-friendly medications to think about, mycophenolate mofetil, certainly rituximab, and then things in parentheses here, which I think the jury's still out, but I think they're kind of at least being talked about now, would be abatacept and tocilizumab. Um, and then flares for severe presentations. Of course, as rheumatologists, we always think about glucocorticoids given their, how quickly they work. And I'll go over some of the data that there's been some issue related to how this could worsen uh, patients with fibrosis. And certainly some patients who are in extremis admitted, you know, life-threatening critical illness, cytoxin is certainly things to be thinking about. So let's talk about glucocorticoids. Um, so I try to avoid use in UIP unless they're exacerbations. And obviously really think hard about PJP prophylaxis until on a below 15 milligrams of prednisone. These patients are really at high risk of getting PJP related to their lung damage. And obviously the toxicity and side effects need close monitoring. Um, so why are we so hesitant now beyond the you know, usual reasons we don't like glucocorticoids. Well, there was a trial called the Panther IPF trial that was uh, published in the New England Journal in 2012. So this is not an RAILD, but I think it has been extrapolated to particularly to the fibrotic subtypes. So this was for IPF patients and they were randomized to three groups, one with prednisone, azathioprine, and N-acetylcysteine, one with N-acetylcysteine alone, and then one to placebo. And actually surprisingly, completely contrary to the hypothesis, was that the combination therapy of prednisone, azathioprine, and N-acetylcysteine actually had increased risk of death and hospitalization compared to placebo. And if you noticed, I didn't put azathioprine on the um, list of medications either. Because of this trial, azathioprine is really not being used quite as much. And again, you don't really know whether it was the prednisone or azathioprine. Um, and certainly there are instances where you might think about using it, but uh, for the most part, we try to avoid it based on this trial evidence. So mycophenolate mofetil, as you know, there's good evidence of efficacy in, in ILDs and particular IPF. And as you probably already know, these patients often flare in their joints. So that's another difficult thing about ILD is that they have lung involvement, they have joint involvement. Sometimes both are active, sometimes one's active and the other's not. You know, sometimes one's in remission and the other flares. So it can be a bit of a juggling act. And again, this is why the multidisciplinary approach is so important. Um, so certainly I think this is a pretty popular option and I think we still use a lot of it, but just know that we may need to use other DMARDs in combination and particular things like hydroxychloroquine, which obviously is, seems pretty safe from all set aspects. Um, and if they have a lung predominant RALD, certainly this is something to think about. Um, I have had issues with GI intolerability, so certainly thinking about mycophenolic acid, um, and certainly you may need to titrate up on the dose and you might know, need to you know, give them a good run of this to see whether it works or not. So rituximab is certainly you know, probably the go-to drug for patients where you know they have a lot of joint disease, you know they have a lot of lung disease. Um, not a lot of great evidence. Most of these are observational studies, um, but they do suggest that these patients do better compared to other types of DMARDs. Um, and there also seems to be a bene potential benefit in RA-related bronchiectasis for prevention of exacerbations. I think the typical downsides with rituximab are the long-acting nature of it. And in the COVID era now, I think we're worried about giving rituxan and susceptibility to infections, in particular COVID. Um, so I think that's been also a juggling act as far as um, you know, reluctance to want to start that in the COVID era and you know, wanting to delay you know, infusions, and that's probably its own topic. But certainly this is um, you know, really highly used. Um, I've already mentioned cyclophosphamide. Definitely consider using this in severe forms of RALD, sometimes in combination with the other therapies. 
Um, certainly these patients are typically quite ill, often in the hospital, maybe in the ICU. Um, and even for refractory cases, you might consider uh, tacrolimus, cyclosporin, calcineurin inhibitors. Um, so I've already kind of previewed about my thoughts of antifibrotics. We are using these a bit more often, and this is off-label for RA. Um, but nantendineb has been approved for IPF, scleroderma ILD, and chronic fibrosing ILD, and the perfenidone has been approved for IPF and then classifiable ILD. Um, and as part of these trials, some of them did include patients with RALD, um, and perfenidone is currently under investigation for RALD, the trail one study, which hopefully will have some good results and hopefully an FDA approval so we can use this on label. Um, but both have been shown to slow the decline of FBC, um, Unclear clinical significance, but I think, you know, for the most part, we're gaining traction with these medications and they seem to be helpful. Um, these do have uh, pretty prominent GI side effects, which can be limiting, in particular diarrhea. Some of them have rash, um, and this does get to the point where patients won't use the medications. Uh, and again, really using this for the fibrotic subtype, that would be UIP. Um, so tocilizumab, um, this is sort of hot breaking off the press. I think just this week, the FDA announced that they approved uh, tocilizumab for uh, systemic sclerosis-related ILD. And um, I think it's really tantalizing to think about what this might be doing to the lungs in patients with RA ILD. Obviously, it's probably you know used a lot already in these patients. Um, so I think this will be a you know an area of research and. I think it at least gets you on the list to think about. I don't think it's at the top of the list, but um, it certainly might be a reasonable option for patients with joint predominant clinical course and patients with concurrent RALD. You know, maybe those patients that have subclinical findings um, and have a lot of joint predominant disease, this could be a reasonable option. Um, so methotrexate, um, uh, so this is, uh, I think, really had a, an image makeover over the last few years. When I was a fellow, everyone was worried about the lung um, uh, effects of methotrexate. And in fact, we just did a study in the CERT trial, which was placebo-controlled. And the thing everyone worries about is methotrexate-induced pneumonitis. And this certainly does occur, but rarely. So there were seven cases of, of, of this within CERT, which is 0.3% of the population versus just one on placebo. Um, and so 0.3%, you know, it does happen. This is a life-threatening, you know, severe outcome, but it's really uncommon. And then there's been some other studies related to methotrexate and incident RALD, three different studies, um, one within the UK that showed a reduced odds ratio, a multi-database study which showed a reduced odds ratio, and we also did it within our BRAS study. And actually all of them had, um, were significantly protective um, but I think appropriately, all of these studies sort of frame this as saying that there's no increased risk rather than that there's a decreased risk. Um, and I think it is reasonable to obtain a chest X-ray before starting methotrexate to establish a baseline, really to exonerate it if anything would happen, because there's so much that can happen in the lungs in these patients. Um, just to reiterate, the hydroxychloroquine is very long, uh, safe from a lung perspective, and I think it's been very helpful for patients with RAILD um, and you know, these patients, you know, if they get a pneumonia, if they get um, infection, you know, that can really be severe in these patients. So I think having, you know, an option that really doesn't affect them much related to infectious risk is, is helpful and to kind of, you know, you know, put them, uh, stem the kind of uh, risk from uh, arthritis affair, uh, flare. Uh, so again, I think I use this quite a bit in my patients as to as try to uh, an add-on therapy to try to you know maintain their articular control. Uh, so TNF inhibitors are you know quite controversial. I think um, I think everyone's got their own anecdote of starting you know patients on a med and then them having you know some inflammation in their lung and you know there certainly could be some uh, some truth to that with TNF inhibitors, but. You know, most of these are case reports and case series. The you know sort of causal relationship is really unclear. Um, certainly, I feel like this this group of medications is not thought to have efficacy, so it's not something you would really want to treat the lungs with. But you know, whether you'd want to start this in patients that have known RALD, I think with all the other options, I do typically avoid it in, in patients who have clinically significant RALD. I think the more common scenario is for patients who have incidentally discovered lung abnormalities on imaging. I generally continue these medications and just monitor them closely. 
Um, but I think there's a wide practice uh, variability around that issue. And I think this is why it's so important to think hard about RAILD and to get better research results. Uh, so Abitasap, this has been kind of a slowly um, uh, building movement about there being more and more positive evidence about this as being a potential therapy actually for RAILD. And it's interesting because it started off as having more COPD exacerbations in RA clinical trials, um, but COPD and RAILD aren't the same thing. And um, there were observational studies first showing that this was similar to other biologic DMARDs. Then there were observational studies showing that Abitasap might be better than some of the other DMARDs. Uh, and then a recent open label trial in RALD suggests efficacy. So um, I think this is something to certainly consider in patients that again, have sort of subclinical lung disease and have a lot of articular damage, particularly if they're seropositive, um, but there's more to come here. All right, so back to the case. So again, this is a, the, the woman with pretty early onset RA who developed what looks to be RAILD. Um, so what medication changes or additions would you offer um, so this was not a poll question because there really was not a right answer. Uh, so the options would be um, watchful waiting, serial set CT chest, PFTs. Um, you know, maybe she's in a, a, a slight flare that's going to get better. Maybe it's a viral syndrome that's going to get better. So certainly it could be reasonable just to wait. And obviously getting pulmonary involved would be helpful. The second would be to add nintendineb, continue methotrexate, and add alimumab. Um, so if this is someone you think has a fibrotic UIP pattern, they're already having symptoms, you want to stop them from declining, so adding an antifibrotic might make sense. A third might be to add mycophenolate mofetil, um, or maybe in sequence after the nintendineb. And even a third option might be to add rituximab and discontinue the adalimumab. Um, so if you're really worried that, you know, maybe the adalimumab was contributing to RALD onset, that maybe you swap that out with rituximab, which probably has some of the best data for RALD. Uh, notice that I continue methotrexate in all this, and actually the draft guidelines, which will hopefully be published this year for RA management, do um, say that you can continue methotrexate. Um, certainly, if you wanted to offload it, it wouldn't be wrong, but uh, it's certainly, you know, becoming exonerating met methotrexate has been one of the themes of the last few years. Uh, and again, I think this is someone that is not an extremist, is not someone that's, you know, being hospitalized or in a, a, a bad flare, so avoiding glucocorticoids, which I think is another sea change that 10 years ago we might have thought about treating it with steroids. All right, so in conclusion, I hope you agree that this is um, a very important topic for RA. There's a high prevalence of subclinical RALD, but the clinical prevalence is, you know, three to 7%. There's a lot of heterogeneity within RALD subtypes. UIP is the most common, NSIP is the next most common, and a lot of progress is being understood. There's a lot of RALD risk factors, and, you know, many of our medications are, are important in management of these diseases, and I hope you agree that interdisciplinary approach is key. So I have a great team of uh, pulmonologists and radiologists here. And I think uh, this is something as a rheumatologist, you need to have your go-to team related to lung manifestations of rheumatic diseases. So I'll look forward to um, our live chat soon with Dr. Kush. Um, feel free to email me or tweet me. And thanks again for your attention.